Gita is very mod modest. You didn't mention that you're also one of my PhD advisors. And <laughs> also that uh, it's Gita who started ITK SNAP. And I, I've just, uh, thanks to Gita, I've been able to work on that tool. And, and actually, I'm very happy that we're now working again together on a ITK SNAP grant, which is the main reason that I'm here. But I won't talk about SNAP. I'll um, talk today about uh, some of the uh, work we're doing. Um, the methodological work uh, I'll, I'll mention in the second half of the talk is uh, really led by Hong Zi Wang, who is uh, just an exceptionally smart guy. Um, there he is, if you haven't met him at one of the conferences. Um, also, uh, Sandy Das and Dan Adler are very much responsible for the stuff I'll talk about in the first part of the talk. And of course, there's many, many other people to acknowledge. Um, so, I'm, I broke up the presentation today into two halves. Uh, one is kind of an extended motivation, uh, which gives a very brief kind of honor, overview of our uh, work on uh, biomarkers for neurodegenerative disease and uh, accurate, careful modeling of uh, anatomy in the hippocampus. Um, but the main focus will be on a little bit more methodological stuff. Uh, which uh, revolves around different um, ways of using example images with segmentations to segment new images. So we have kind of different ways that we're hacking away at the segmentation problem. And so um, there's uh, label fusion, there's ex this recent extension uh, of label fusion to correspondence finding, and there's also a uh, kind of post-processing of segmentations with machine learning algorithms that they all kind of loosely fit together into a, a set of methods. So um, starting out with motivation, um, we're interested in uh, developing imaging-based biomarkers for ne neurodegenerative disease and sort of neuro motivation there. If we look at disease like Alzheimer's disease, which uh, is a huge problem uh, facing our society uh, in, in the upcoming years. Um, disease develops very slowly, and by the time symptoms are seen, uh, it's very unlikely that any treatment is going to be uh, helpful. So we, what we want is to uh, target treatments towards earlier stages of um, the Alzheimer's disease. And in order to do that, first of all, we need to be able to know who's going to develop it. Um, so that we know who to, uh, who's a candidate for uh, clinical trials for these treatments. And, and so we want to push that recruitment window back in time. And second of all, we want to know whether our treatments are working. And uh, with diseases such as Alzheimer's, which develop very slowly, uh, waiting for five years to see if uh, certain uh, cognitive uh, performance uh, changes in subjects that are receiving treatment and uh, changes more in subjects who are not receiving treatment, that's too costly. You want to condense the time that it takes to perform a clinical trial. And so various kinds of uh, biomarkers have been proposed uh, that can do this. Uh, in particular, a lot of the biomarker work is focused on uh, chemical uh, biomarkers, so you can do a spinal tap and uh, measure amyloid uh, in your uh, cerebrospinal fluid and find a, you know, very early on, before any symptoms show up, uh, find people who are at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, but th these kinds of chemical biomarkers, then once we are in a stage where the disease is affecting um, the brain, they they change very slowly over time. So in these stages when we would be performing uh, clinical trials, they change very slowly over time. And so they're not really useful for um, the second type of biomarker that I described, which is to, to track the progression of the disease. Um, likewise, cognitive performance or uh, functional uh, daily living, the, these kind of um, biomarkers change very rapidly, but too late in a disease to be useful for a clinical trial. And so it turns out that there's a couple imaging biomarkers like uh, FDG-PET and MRI that are particularly um, fast changing in the window of time when 
we're interested in um, um, in testing out drugs for Alzheimer's disease. And out of those two, um, MRI has a much lower repeat measurement error, so it's much more robust to small changes. And so, so structures in the brain in these early stages change at a couple percent a year, so we're really talking about very, very um, sensitive measurements that we need to be able to make. So, and within MRI, there have been a lot of work uh, recently with ADNI and proposing different types of biomarkers um, that look at some different combination of regions in the brain and uh, based on those try to tell whether the brain is changing or you know once we have a treatment whether the treatment is uh, slowing that change down. And so there are kind of two schools of thought when it comes to all these MRI based biomarkers. One is this kind of data driven approach where you try to learn a conglomerate of structures in the brain uh, from some data. An example of that might be doing a classification between patients who are going to go on to develop Alzheimer's versus patients who are not going to develop Alzheimer's uh, and, and look for change in those regions. Uh, another approach uh, is a little more basic is to say, well, let's, look, look, let's focus on structures that we know a priori are affected by the disease. So we can know that from pathology studies and in particular um, the hippocampus and sur surrounding uh, brain regions are implicated in early AD. So there's been a lot of work in this, and some of the best known work is by Brock and Brock, where they've staged the, the progression of Alzheimer's disease and how it uh, starts out in this transenterinal region, goes through the enterinal cortex, and uh, early on affects some parts of the hippocampal formation and then eventually over time kind of spreads throughout uh, the medial temporal lobe of the brain and throughout the rest of the brain. So, um, so what we see here is you know, the progression of Alzheimer's disease is complex. And if we look at other diseases that affect the hippocampus, and um, there are many, um, they all have these non-trivial patterns of progression. And in fact, uh, this region, uh, the hippocampal region itself is a very com complex anatomical region. Um, some of these pictures here are meant to demonstrate that. So there are a lot of uh, structures and substructures and layers. And um, of course, all of these have different function. Uh, it's not fully understood exactly how they all uh, function together. And even where to draw these boundaries has not been really agreed in, not only in the imaging literature, but in the pathology literature. There's a debate about where these structures lie. Um, and what happens when we go into the world of MRI and image analysis, we go and tend to represent the hippocampus with a blob like that. And then we'll look at the volume of that blob and we'll talk about how that volume of that blob changes over time. So there's some oversimplification uh, going on. And so kind of where, what we're trying to do with our um, <coughs> biomarker research is to go beyond this blob and try to um, learn a little bit more about details of hippocampal anatomy. And uh, right now there are a number of groups that are uh, going in this direction or have been working in this direction. So just to um, show you again this, this, this uh, blob image. The reason we typically represent the hippocampus as a blob is because if you look at a one millimeter uh, T1 MRI, which is your standard kind of clinical whole brain scan, you actually can't see any additional detail. So if you can't see any additional detail, how do you know where some of this uh, finer substructure lies? So it, it turns out that in the same amount of time as it takes to acquire this uh, T1 scan, on the same scanner you can get a um, slightly different T2 weighted scan with anisotropic voxels where you can actually start to make out some of the details of the hippocampal formation. And so um, some of our work is focused on trying to segment these images. So you, as you can see, they're kind of uh, pretty noisy images, but there's some structure visible. And so um, that, that's where we got into the multi-atlas segmentation, is trying to get decent segmentations for images like these. Um, where a lot of the field is going is into higher field. Uh, so this is an example of a scan that we got on our 7T scanner at Penn. But 
uh, if we look at the literature uh, in ISMRM, there's just some very beautiful scans that people have been able to acquire. Um, some groups uh, get resolution in order of uh, 0.3 by 0.3 by 0.3 um, millimeter isotropic. So, and I think this this is quite nice, you know, because a lot of the algorithms that we're right now developing on this more inferior 3T data uh, are going to work really well when the data quality improves. So uh, there's been quite a bit of work uh, on labeling these uh, subfields of the hippocampus. Uh, some of this work is focused on T1 MRI where, again, you can't really see these substructures. So people try to infer their location based on where they should be relative to the overall hippocampus shape or relative to certain landmarks. Um, and uh, the other side uh, of, work, of this prior work has been on looking at these kind of T2 images that are more hippocampus specific. And um, until recently, it's really focused on manual segmentation. So our kind of idea was, well, we want to work with these high resolution images. We definitely don't want to do manual segmentation because manual segmentation, something like this can take four hours for somebody to do if they're a well-trained expert. And you know, if this is going to be incorporated into uh, large scale studies or clinical trials, I mean, as a matter of fact, this type of protocol is going to be incorporated into ADNI too, the, sort of into the next uh, generation of ADNI. So um, you know, we just can't afford to do this uh, manually. So our kind of overall um, vision is kind of complex. So we we want to start out with um, postmortem data because postmortem data is where we can really understand uh, hippocampal anatomy in detail. So um, postmortem data means postmortem MRI, but even in the highest resolution MRI that we can acquire, there's still a lot of uh, anatomical boundaries that we cannot see. And so in order to really understand anatomy, we need to go all the way to the level of uh, looking at cells and cell level properties. And so we want to put together MRI and histology um, from multiple subjects and put it together into a postmortem atlas. So then we, what we want to do is take this postmortem atlas and co-register it to a reference data set where we have, for the same set of subjects, we have uh, very high resolution in vivo scans acquired at 7 Tesla, and then more clinical quality scans that are acquired at 3 Tesla. So, so a subject would have something that's kind of like this, but with higher SNR because they'll be scanned for maybe a half an hour um, to get a higher high SNR image and a scan like this. And so what we are going to do is map the postmortem atlas into the 7T image, propagate it to the 3T image, and we end up what we call it an in vivo atlas. So basically a set of MRI scans that have been labeled uh, based on anatomical information all the way from, uh, from the histology. Um, resolution. And then we're going to take in these new three Tesla MRIs and try to propagate these segmentations into the new three Tesla MRI and end up, end up with a segmentation. Um, so that, that's kind of our uh, long-term vision. This is where we are right now. Um, so we have, we, are work, we have some work in the postmortem atlas uh, realm, and we have been in parallel working in the in vivo realm without having really connected the two. So right now we kind of have an atlas that's been segmented manually that we then propagate these manual segmentations to new um, subjects. And of course, the limitation of this is that, you know, no matter how smart our manual segmenters are, they still don't see the underlying uh, microanatomy, so they're still unable to really truly know where the boundaries between structures are. And so what's the point of all this? Um, well, there's there are a lot of questions that we could answer or answer better if we have uh, an accurate segmentation of the hippocampal region. Um, so for example, there's a lot of interest in differential diagnosis. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common uh, cause of dementia, but there are many other types of dementia, and uh, it's quite important to be able to 
uh, diagnose, and there are also a lot of comorbid conditions with Alzheimer's disease in a lot of patients. Um, longitudinally, we'd like to be able to uh, make our longitudinal biomarkers, so our ability to measure change um, in the brain over time to be more sensitive, and if we are able to measure change in sub in parts of the medial temporal lobe that are known to be most affected by the disease, then perhaps we can increase sensitivity. Um, we can also do a lot of interesting analysis in functional MRI. Um, so we already began doing that, looking at um, there are a lot of uh, functional networks within the me medial temporal lobe that are important uh, for memory and for uh, diseases that affect memory, and so we can can look at these uh, networks, if we can label these subfields of the hippocampus, and we can try to uh, look at networks uh, between them. And we can ask a question, a very interesting question, does, is there a functional change that is a precursor to neurodegeneration? And, and we have some preliminary data that suggests there might be uh, in the medial temporal lobe. And uh, another thing, very interesting um, thing that this will allow us to do is, uh, look at how the distribution of pathology actually relates to the um, macroscopic changes we can see in MRI. So if we can map, so in histology space, we can stain for pathology. We can stain for tau protein, which is uh, what forms um, in, in cells before the cells die in Alzheimer's disease. So we can map this distribution of tau, uh, of um, neurofibrillary tangles with tau protein into a in vivo space and then see you know, how, how, how the hippocampal shrinking in, in vivo brain relates to that distribution of pathology. Not, you're not looking at these pictures side by side, but actually have the data in the right space. So I, I think there's a lot of promise um, that this allows us to do. So a few slides on this Atlas building effort. So uh, we've been scanning uh, post-mortem samples uh, of human brain where we excise the hippocampus and a little bit of tissue around it, and we scan it in overnight, um, overnight on an animal scanner with a special coil that's really best fitted for the length and the size of the hippocampus, and um, get very nice uh, 200 micron images um, isotropic covering with full hippocampus coverage. Um, this is quite interesting for me because I, li like a lot of you, came from computer science and then all of a sudden I was cutting brains and scanning them and <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was quite an experience and I would, I would actually recommend it to people who, who, who do go into medical imaging fields. Sometimes some of this hands-on stuff is quite, quite fun and you learn a lot of things in the process. Um, so, you know, when we have this high quality data, we can certainly do a better job of segmentation than we can in in vivo, but really, really accurate segmentation requires us to go into the uh, histology space, like I mentioned. So here is just some examples where we are actually drawing these boundaries, not at this, you know, scale, but looking at you know, looking at the cell scale and looking, oh, you know, there's these uh, nuclei are becoming larger, you know, so that's a probable location for the CA1, CA2 boundary, or there's uh, appearance of uh, some f fibers crossing through the, um, through the hippocampus layer here, and so that's kind of CA2, CA3 boundary. So, um, you know, it's... As you get into this kind of scale, though, you can look at the they are, they are smooth transitions, and that's actually, so... Um, going back to what I said about mapping the information from from uh, microscopic to macroscopic, we might as well just do away with a lot of these artificial labels and, and just, you know, be able to relate, well, let's just talk about cell density and how it relates to neurodegeneration. Exactly. 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 So that's that's one of the one one of our goals. Yeah, because it's it's very hard to define these these, these little regions to begin with. It was it was based on this. It was based. This was done um, beginning of twentieth century. 
um, and you know there are some. So uh, Ramon and Cajal is uh, sort of the famous neuroanatomist who did some of this early, uh, early, early. I mean, I think the actual labels might go back even to like 16th century or something like that. But uh, I mean, it's the dente gyrus here is is called that because it looks like a tooth, for example. But uh, you know, I, my knowledge of this is a bit cursory, but. Uh, it's certainly, the, the yeah, the, the labeling, and, and this is why we're going into histological suicide, because the, if you look at a, you know, a book written by an anatomist on this topic, they talk about how to differentiate these structures based on cell, la cell features. And in fact, a lot of the criticism that uh, people get with MRI of subfields is that you can't tell, because there's a lot of these boundaries actually do not n necessarily correspond to any geometric features. So they, they, they may vary uh, from subject to subject. So part of what we want to do is try to capture that variability. So that's, that, that, that's the next couple of slides. It's, it's a very good point. It's, um, it's, it's not easy, but uh, I, think, I think we're doing a reasonably good job. So we've, we have kind of uh, somewhat uh, ad hoc and multi-step um, algorithm for doing this, which um, involves a series of steps. There's a step where we line up pairs of histological slices together to kind of build up a 3D volume. And we do this um, essentially skipping slices that don't register well to their neighbors so that there's not a huge propagation of error that happens. That gives us an initial 3D volume that we can then register to the MR volume. And then we can kind of go slice by slice and register the uh, histology volumes to the corresponding MR volumes while still keeping them relatively close to their neighbor MR volumes. So this kind of iterative process eventually gets uh, things in the right location. And then we have kind of last step where we do a diffeomorphic registration where each slice is registered to its MR counterpart and also to its previous and following slice. And this is again done iteratively, so there's kind of a smoothing out across the Z dimension. So it's a, it's a 2D plus registration. Um, it could be made, you know, there's, there's some parameters that we do not uh, uh, take care of. Like, for example, you know, the angle between slices is assumed to be always, uh, they're assumed to be parallel. Um, even the spacing, we should be able to control. We should be controlling for spacing because there's sometimes throwaway slices. And so, another thing that we do is, <coughs> um, after we image the whole hippocampus, we cut it up into these slabs that go into histology, and we scan the slabs again. So there's a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between the tissue that's imaged and the tissue that's actually sectioned. So, so it's a little easier to find things. So here, here's some examples of these. Um, so, so the histology is done in the coronal view. So these are the reconstructions in the axial and sagittal view. Uh, they look pretty awful, but part of the reason is because we, we haven't normalized the intensity here between neighboring slices. So, so some kind of histogram matching, a regional histogram matching would just make this vi visually much more pleasing. And here, here's the uh, segmentation from histology space that's been mapped into the MR space. And the, the thing um, that is nice about this is even though the histology MR registration is not perfect, it's not, you know, these segmentations, when we look at them, they're kind of um, <coughs> blocky and they're certainly missing places. But the, what do we really, really care about are certain boundaries, um, the location of certain boundaries um, here in the hip, like maybe where I draw a line over here. And even if the registration is not perfect, we can go through, we can go back and correct that. And we're still going to be drawing those boundaries in the right places. Um, so, it's, so it's not, you know, on this level, accuracy at the level of one or two voxels is not, is not that big of a deal. <coughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, it's that step when I, th I talked about where we align the, when we just initially take a bunch of slices and we want to stack them into a 3D stack. So in order to skip slices that are potentially uh, high, would propagate a lot of error, we build a graph, just a one-dimensional graph of every, where every slice is a node and their um, edges connecting 
the slice to a bunch of its neighboring slices. And so, th so then um, we, build, we look for shortest path in that graph. So if there's, you're bored, there's no worry. that's okay. I'll <laughs> what are you drawing? <laughs> are you drawing the walls? Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't want to ruin your nice <laughs> room. <laughs> Yeah, so if you have if you have a bad slice, it's it's really simple. But you have if you have a bad slice, um, so there all these different um, edges in the graph. So if we're we're saying okay, we want to find uh, a registration from this slice to some you know let's call this a reference slice. So we're we're looking for the shortest path in this graph. So in the shortest and, and these the costs of the of these edges are based on similarity metric between the slices after registration. So if this slice is you know very distorted or there's a chunk missing, then uh, we're just going to end up is going the path is going to be uh, cheaper jumping over that slice rather than passing through it. So we're going to combine register this to this and this to this and this to this, and we end up skipping the slice. So that's the graph theoretic in it, but it's it's really not. <laughs> it's not like a graph cut. Yeah, it's it's more. It's about like the there's this banana problem in histology reconstruction. So you, you know you might you you want to reconstruct something like this, but because of propagation of error, you get something that looks like a banana. So it's um. It allows us to kind of have less of a banana problem. Um. Anyway, so once we have this, these images and segmentations, we can put them together into, uh, into an atlas and do the kind of computational anatomy stuff that uh, you know, Sarang and, and his colleagues have really pioneered. And um, you know, he, here is our kind of more, more recent atlas. So this is, this is from averaging about, yeah, this 20, I think it's 15 out of the 25 samples that we have scanned have been, you know, diffeomorphically averaged uh, in this uh, in this atlas, and it kind of, you know, it looks nice. But there's some things we look at here. There's like a little feature over here that's not really an anatomical feature in the hippocampus. It, wh what it is is just some some, you know, this little you see this little dark band. We actually call it dark band, and so. Because of misregistration, you know that little feature propagated in the average, and then this average we again re-register everybody to the average, and again average. And so this, so one of the issues I think with this approach is that you know if if you make an error early on in the averaging and it's um, strong enough to not get washed out by the averaging, so it's, so it kind of retains, um, you know. <coughs> Some some uh, intensity pattern that's characteristic then is going to you know prob keep propagating itself through the uh, through the iterations and it's going to end up being there in the final average and so um, I'll get to later uh, this um, groupwise correspondence approach that we're hoping is going to actually help us deal with this problem a little bit so I mean it's ultimately an optimization problem because we're not finding a perfect registration at some point but. Uh, So, so this kind of stuff here. Well, no, this this bright line is actually there. Oh, this stuff over here. Yeah, that's outside of a mask. Actually, there is a mask that's being applied. So, yeah, that's the, the stuff outside of the hippocampal body. Yeah, we're not even. We're just not. Yeah, we're masking it out. Just the whole, just rough segmentations of the whole hippocampus to give us the mask. Yeah, without it, it's. Yeah, it's a horrible initialization problem. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's actually a horrible initialization problem. So what we do, we segment these hippocampi, then we fit the medial model to them. That gives us an initial kind of shape-based correspondence, which so there's a lot, a lot that I, I, I don't mention here. But um, 
even with that initialization, it's still hard to get everything right. Anyway, so the so the uh, the other part of what we're doing is trying to do kind of label the same structures in in vivo images right now based on our manual segmentations, but ultimately, you know, the idea is to bring this information from the postmortem space into the in vivo space. And so what I'll talk the methods that I'll talk about in the second half are uh, really came out from having to do this somewhat hard segmentation problem. So um, i try to go fast, especially through the basic stuff. So I think uh, everybody is probably familiar with atlas-based segmentation, the basic idea. If you can register two images, one image to another, and one image segmented is segmented, then you can propagate that segmentation to the second image, and you have a segmentation of your second image. And the important thing is, if you had perfect registration algorithm that perfectly matched anatomical correspondences, if such a thing even existed, then you wouldn't need segmentation at all. So if you had a perfect registration algorithm, then single atlas segmentation would be all that you need. Of course, the, the problem is that uh, registration is far from perfect. So, um, you know, a big improvement for uh, atlas-based segmentation is when we go from having you know, some arbitrarily picked subject as your atlas to uh, deriving uh, an atlas as a population average, again, using, uh, using these uh, uh, techniques for, uh, from Guimond and then the diffeomorphic uh, ideas from Sarang. Um, so that, you, know, you end up with a template that's much more similar to the rest of your uh, images than if you pick some arbitrarily chosen atlas. And so then if you segment that template, then you end up with a much better segmentations of the subjects than if you start with somebody um, arbitrary. Well, in the, uh, the multi-atlas framework, um, the setup is very simple. It's just instead of having one subject that's been segmented, we have a large number of subjects or, well, not large, but maybe 10 or 20 subjects, uh, each of which have a segmentation. They all get registered to the target image. And so each one gives a candidate segmentation. So each one is like a guess at what the segmentation is. And so then all the interesting stuff happens in taking those guesses and somehow combining them into a single consensus guess. Um, so um, this been an explosion of work in this area uh, in the last couple of years. So it's, I, I can't list all the different ideas that have been proposed, but some of the kind of more prominent ones are early stuff is like majority voting and staple, and I'll mention them real quick. And more recently, uh, some very good results were obtained where um, we include similarity between the atlas and the target image in deciding how much to weigh each candidate segmentation in the consensus. So, <coughs> so the most classical strategy um, is majority voting. Um, you know, I referenced Rolfing here, but it probably goes back much further than that. Um, so, you know, here we have all these candidate segmentations. So we just let them vote. So at every voxel, you might have five guesses whether it's hippocampus or background. If three guesses say hippocampus, two say background, you say it's going to be hippocampus. Um, so um, Simon Warfield has this uh, famous staple algorithm, which can also be used um, in the context of um, label fusion. So the algorithm was developed uh, with the idea that you want to combine segmentations from different uh, human raters, human experts with different degrees of uh, reliability. And so you want to simultaneously estimate uh, the true segmentation that they're all trying to achieve and also estimate each rater's quality. And so um, this is, uh, ends up being a, a, an optimization problem over um, sort of the unknown um, the hidden true segmentation, which is set up as a hidden variable in the sensitivity and specificity of each rater, which are also unknown. And so your observations are the candidate segmentations. And, and so using the EM algorithm, you end up with a solution. But uh, just like the 
majority voting staple uh, only looks at the candidate segmentations. It doesn't look at the anatomical images behind them. So, so and, and that ends up being, uh, in practice, a limitation. So, uh, similarity-weighted methods work on the principle that, um, you know, if you have your target image uh, and you have some population of uh, images, atlases, your target is probably closer to some of these atlases than to others anatomically. And so if, if a certain atlas is anatomically more similar to the target, then the error uh, that its candidate segmentation is going to have is probably smaller than some of these far away atlases. And so if we could just figure out you know, how close a particular atlas is to the target image, we could then somehow weigh them proportionally. And um, Mm-hmm. Well, there, so it started out like that, but then very quickly people said, let's, let's let the weight sp vary spatially. So I, I have a slide, I think, one or two slides later just about talking about that. So, um, you know, so one, one uh, possibility is to have um, K best, you know, K best majority voting. So instead of letting all the atlases do majority voting, you pick, you know, the three atlases that are closest to the target and let them do majority voting. And this closeness is almost universally uh, measured by looking at the similarity, intensity similarity between your target image and your co-registered um, atlases. So we might pick the three atlases that are most similar after registration to the target image and do, you know, uh, do majority voting among those three or five or seven best atlases. And that actually, um, I don't have the reference, but uh, this, is, uh, this was done by Louis Collins at MNI. Uh, it's one of the early label fusion papers. And, uh, you know, it do did much better than majority voting on its own. Um, but there is, a, there is a slight problem with these K-best approaches, and that is that you, know, you'd you don't always end up in a situation where you have a few neighbors that are really, really close, and the rest are scattered somewhere far else in space. Sometimes you know, each one of the atlases is actually you know, just slightly better than random at telling you the segmentation. And then what you, in that situation, you really want to use as many of them as possible because, you know, the, the more, it, it, this, this all is very closely related to classifier fusion, for example. So if you have these, you know, independent or at least not fully correlated classifiers that are each kind of weak, but if you can combine a lot of them, the more of them you combine, the, 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 the less error you're going to have because, uh, so, so just discarding, you know, 90% of your atlases is not always optimal. And, and, and it's easy to sh actually show that quantitatively. So uh, answering Gita's question, so th this is a uh, picture from a uh, paper by Arte Chivaria from 2009. And they, they precisely say, you know, you, you don't necessarily have the best matching atlas globally. You know, locally, atlas one might be match uh, your target image much better. and one spot and another atlas might match your atlas, match much better in another spot. So you should really make these decisions on a local basis, not on a global basis. And here's kind of an example. Um, this is from our, our earlier work of you know this this in actually being applied. So you, we have here a target image and a couple of atlases have been co-registered. So each atlas here we're looking at just one structure. So each atlas has its own segmentation. We compute some kind of similarity map. This is cross-correlation here, for example. And somehow we go from the similarity to a weight map. And you know, how do we do this is actually important. Um, and then, so we, then we take a weighted sum of these segmentations with these weight maps, and we end up with a consensus segmentation. So it's, it's, um, so it's weighted voting that happens. And so, um, in a couple of papers, um, sort of uh, fairly prominent papers that have proposed these types of techniques, 
The idea is you look at each atlas, compare it to the target image, measure the intensity similarity. So that's what this term is doing over a neighborhood. You do it, you do it locally. And then somehow you take that value, you take that similarity value and convert it to a weight for that atlas. And then finally you need your weights to add up to one, so you divide by some normalizing factor so that all your weights are add up to one. So you know the function that you apply to similarity, uh, different versions were proposed, so it could be uh, an inverse polynomial, it can be uh, uh, exponential, but you know some function that the higher the similarity, the lower the weight. The higher the dissimilarity, the lower the weight. And, and I mean, one issue is that it's kind of, you know, how do you, wh what is the right function to use here is not always clear. And, um, you know, but, but the other issue here um, that, that we focused in on is, is this problem of redundancy. And there's a very simple example we can take. Let's say we have, um, 10 atlases, and then we take one of those atlases and we just replicate it 100 times. So we end up with a data set of 110 atlases in which 100, you know, one same atlas is repeated 100 times. And let's say you know, we do this kind of a weighting technique, so that atlas might be a very, very poor match for my brain anatomy. But because it's repeated 100 times, its weight is going to be amplified 100 times as well. Um, does that, is that going to help me segment my brain any better? So my, our, our argument, no, it's not. Just because something is really prevalent in the population doesn't mean that it should be given greater weight during segmentation. Of course, you know, in the real world, we don't have the same brain replicated 100 times, but we certainly have anatomical patterns that are more prevalent and are less prevalent. And so the point here is that if we just only do single atlas to target similarity uh, as our basis for deciding weights, we're never considering uh, possible redundancies among atlases. And so uh, Hangzhi in his paper, um, this was his IPMI 2011 paper, um, came up with a, me with a method that essentially uh, accounts for some of this redundancy and the way we formulate it is that what we want is, um, so, so here we have these atlas candidate segmentations, SIs, and we know we want to take some weighted sum of these candidate segmentations to be the consensus segmentation. But we don't know what the weights should be. We know that the weights should add up to one. Um, so we have this, so this is our consensus segmentation. It's this weighted sum of the candidate segmentations. Uh, and for the moment, let's just say that the SIs are either 0 or 1. And all of this is happening just at a single voxel. Okay, so the, the, this is an optimization done at every voxel. So, so this guy is our consensus segmentation, and here is our unknown true segmentation, which we don't, we don't know. But we would like the square um, error, the expected square error to be uh, minimized, conditional on the intensity information that we have. So if we, if we write down this, um, yeah. Right, so we have, what we have to set up here are what are the random variables that are conditioned on this. And so what we, what we end up doing is actually treating the error made by each atlas as a random variable. So, so it's actually the difference between ST and SI as a set of uh, random variables. So they're, they're obviously uh, correlated. And, um, but, you know, for, for, for the moment, um, so let, let's just keep this uh, conditioning here. So we can, we can sim simplify this problem into, this, into matrix form. So because it's, it's quadratic, we, we can actually uh, come up with a, with a solution where um, we have this matrix M whose elements are these um, um, pairwise expectations that two atlases um, jointly make an error. In other words, so this expected value of the true segmentation minus the jth atlas 
times the true segmentation minus the segmentation by the kth atlas um, conditioned on the, on the intensity information. And then what we do, so this we still have no, you know, we, we really don't know what this expectation is because it requires us to know what a true label is. But what we then essentially approximate this with intensity information. So we say, you know, we're saying is in order to solve this minimization problem, we need to be looking at these expectations that are these pairwise expectations that, that involve not a single atlas in the target image, but two atlases in the target image. Um, and then we ask, well, how can we, you know, try to approximate these expectations um, from, from imaging data? And so, you know, this is, this is not like a fundamental approximation. We could come up with many different ways of approximating this, but it's, it's essentially parallels what has been done before um, with um, estimating the weight of each atlas independently, but now we're looking, you know, based on intensity information, but now we're looking at pairs of atlases. And um, yeah, so, so, so the way we approximate, so this expectation essentially boils down, what is the probability that both atlases are wrong? And so we say the probability that both atlases are wrong is somehow proportional to the um, intensity, the similarity of one atlas, uh, or so, so to basically this product of the similarity uh, between one, one atlas and the target image and the other atlas, the target image integrated over, over a neighborhood. And uh, I mean, the, this kind of works so if the two atlases are very, if the intensity patterns of the two atlases are very similar, then these differences are going to be very similar as well. So, um, whereas, it, so, 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 and, and we're, so if the, if the intensities are very similar, we expect that these these errors are also going to be very similar. So, um, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean it's it's a yes, yes, of course. I mean that's it's it's a you know it's an assumption that only gets you so far, you know. So it's it's uh, so I mean there are other ways that we can we've looked at estimating this, and and this is based more like on a cross validation among the atlas sets. So we can you know we can try to mo you know empirically model this expectation, but we actually found that it didn't really help much uh, versus this more. Um, more ad hoc approximation, but um, you know, in the end, in the end, this strategy worked pretty well. So here's some evaluation with um, with whole hippocampus data uh, that that Hongzhi did. So here we're uh, don't worry about these numbers in the parentheses here, but uh, so these are the dice overlaps that we we get uh, with the same set of registrations and majority voting staple. Uh, two of these uh, methods that do not take into account uh, redundancy among the atlas set and, and uh, our method which looks at this uh, joint expectation of atlases. And here's some of these results for uh, hippocampal subfield segmentation. Again, so I mean the improvements are not dramatic be because of this new label fusion strategy, but they, they are significant and for smaller uh, smaller regions they are non-negligible, I would say. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I suspect that, you know, by factoring out this redundancy information, we'll actually do a little bit better in cases of pathology and things like that, where, you know, a certain uh, pattern is underrepresented. So, I mean, the nice thing about th this whole approach is it works in many, many different problems. So we can take what, what works for the hippocampus and make it work for whole brain parcellation, or, you know, here we're segmenting mitral valve and ultrasound. And uh, it's it's just a very, you know, it's, it's like it's we we're talking about this with, with Ross and Suvias. This technique needs a lot of more theoretical development, but it certainly works incredibly well in practice. Um, so, sorry, do we have a few more minutes or?
talk. Just just a few more slides on. Um, so, 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 so a lot of work has been done in this multi-atlas uh, la label using label fusion for um, segmenting ROIs, but um, the same idea uh, can be extended to the to the overall group-wise registration problem. Um, so, in the group-wise registration problem, we ha we want to basically find the correspondences between a set of images. And, uh, you know, it'd be nice to use the same idea. Well, if, you know, if a certain image matches uh, another image uh, well in terms of intensity, then we should, we should um, believe that correspondence better than if, you know, when we take two images, register them, and they don't match very well in terms of intensity. So, so this kind of, uh, I developed this in two parts. So the first, the first, uh, algorithm which, which I call fusion-based correspondence propagation is not meant to be really used in practice, it's just to kind of demonstrate the idea. And so the idea is, um, you know, let's just, just extend multi-label fusion to, so to registration. So let's say we have a set of n atlases where we have a known correspondence to some reference space. And this is why it's not realistic. Normally we don't have like known ground truth correspondences. But let's say we have ground truth correspondences to a reference space which are uh, denoted by these uh, uh, transformations phi1 through phi n. And we have a target image, and we would like to find uh, the mapping from the reference space to the target image. So, so this is the correspondence problem. Um, and actually, notice that the reference space doesn't have any image assigned to it. It's just a coordinate grid. Um, so one way we can do this is, well, let's take this target image and register it to all of our atlases. And, well, one thing we could do is just pick an atlas that matches best and take its correspondence. That would be like a trivial solution. But we could also, you know, just merge these correspondences uh, based on label fusion ideas. And, and this, is, this is what we end up doing. So let's say, you know, so we want to take, uh, you know, let's say this is the best match. So we're going to take its correspondence with a larger weight and you know, we're going to take this one as not such a good match. We're going to give it a slightly worse weight. Now, of course, these are diffeomorphic transformations. We're talking, and I'm, now I'm saying, let's take a bunch of diffeomorphic transformations, average them with different weights. We're going to end up something that is non-diffeomorphic. But we can use that as a, uh, uh, as a target in a registration problem. So, so what we're saying is that, you know, we're looking for a known transformation phi t uh, whose difference from a weighted sum of the transformations from the target image into the reference space uh, is minimized. So, so what we have here, these weights, you know, th these little color maps, so these, these are the weight maps that we compute between the atlas and the target image. And so uh, they tell us how much we want to uh, weight the transformation, so the, compo uh, the composite transformation from the, um, from the reference space all the way to the image. So this is, uh, I guess it's the other way around. So this is psi i composed, so, so phi i inverse composed with psi i, so that gives us a mapping from here, from this space, all the way to the reference space. Um, so by doing this, you know, this we can actually um, optimize. So this uh, in, in a diffeomorphic framework, we also can impose some regularization on phi. So, so essentially, we you know we get a solution which is diffeomorphic, which um, you know approximate is a diffeomorphic approximation of the weighted sum of these transformations with the weights locally varying. And um, in simulated data, this actually works quite well. Um, but what we're really after is not propagating known correspondences, but finding a, a group-wise correspondence. So where we have, uh, you know, let's say here I showed three images, we have some set of n images and the reference space, and we want to find a uh, mapping of each one of these into reference space. And um, so we can, we can essentially use the same idea. So again, so we have now for each image, we have some unknown transformation from reference space into that image, so phi i and phi j. And then we compute registration between 
all pairs of images. So, so the psi ij's are these registrations between all pairs of images, and also for all pairs of images, we compute these weight maps. So for image i, um, we have n of these maps, and these tell us, you know, I want to take uh, the first atlas and take basically its correspondence with certain weight and the second atlas with certain weight and so on. And so if we write this down in terms of a minimization problem, it actually is uh, not too difficult. So we have the sum over all the images of phi i inverse, which says for a point in this space, what is my coordinate in the reference space? And then we have this term, which says if I basically obtain my correspondence through image j, what would be my coordinate in the reference space? So, so for every image, for every other image, I have a path into the reference space. And so I'm taking, again, weighted some of these different paths. And so I want my path to the reference space to be similar to that weighted sum of, all, of the other paths into the reference space. And so this is all added up over all the images simultaneously. And, um, you know, this is again a tractable problem, uh, even though it involves n images, you know, we can, we can work out uh, the gradient of, the, of this energy here, and we can end up with, a, with an updated equation. So, so U here is a displacement field at uh, iteration t. So, th so we solve this using uh, the greedy approach of, again, from from uh, Sarang and Mike Miller, and uh, you know again we we end up optimizing this function, so that's, that's kind of encouraging. So um, here's a little simulated data data set that we created. We created some random diffeomorphic transformations, uh, added some noise, and then uh, we try to to recover that correspondence using sort of this groupwise fusion approach and using the standard diffeomorphic averaging approach. So UPT, here's the unbiased population. Here we're, we're looking at um, relative improvement. So zero would be an experiment where we had no improvement. And you know, so, so we had an improvement in almost all of these simulated experiments. And so th these, these different dots correspond to different parameters of this simulation. So we, we tried different degrees of deformation, different amounts of noise, and so on. Uh, we also try this in the real data. Of course, in real data, we don't know what is a true correspondence. So it's, it's hard to evaluate this uh, in, in real data. Uh, what we do know is um, if we have some segmentations, then a good correspondence should do a good job of lining up segmentations. And so this, this is what we're looking at. So this heat map is looking at all pairs of segmentations and how often they end up agreeing at a voxel. And so, you know, so the darker this heat map, the less, uh, the less segmentation error there is. And it, it turned out in the real data, uh, the improvement was not, not very high. Only, we only got an 8% 8, 8 improvement. But uh, you know, I think there's, there's definitely room to, to, play, you know, to play with this method and make it, make it do more. Um, but, and, and here are some. So this is, uh, this is your uh, unbiased population template uh, that we got. And this is bringing all the data into a template space based on these transformations that we get from, from the uh, uh, label fusion approach. All right. I'm going to skip the last part, which is basically using classifiers to improve uh, segmentation a little bit further. Um, just to close, say, you know, it's, it's like I said, I think uh, multi atlas techniques are generally very effective in practice, they're good at mimicking human experts. They generalize well to new modalities and new anatomy. Um, so even though this has been mostly applied to fusion, fusing labels, uh, we can definitely do this, do more. So we can, we can fuse correspondences, we can fuse distance maps, many other types of data that live in image space. We might, we might be able to fuse them in interesting ways. Um, so there's, you know, I think there's a lot of room in coming up with more theoretically solid approaches for uh, label fusion. And finally, uh, you know, getting this capability to clinical users is not going to be easy. There's a lot of registration that has to happen in order for 
uh, multi-atlas segmentation to work. So um, you typically need you know, some pretty high computing requirements. And one of the things we're, we're playing with now is like, can we use cloud-based things like Amazon Web Service to basically provide this to users so that who don't have a cluster? Because we have uh, some software now. We are, you know, we're actually, I mean, our other con thing is that we have focused on subfields and very few people have this kind of, kind of data that we're uh, telling them to use. But, you know, out of those, very few have the infrastructure to do this now. Anyway, I'll, I'll finish with just a list of some of the software that we, uh, we've made available. So ITK Snap, which is our interactive segmentation software uh, that uh, Guido and I already mentioned. Uh, ANTS is the registration software that uh, underlies all of this by Brian Avance. Uh, and some of, the some of our code for multi-atlas segmentation, our atlas data are, can also be found online.